the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, uh, which sponsors these broadcasts. We have as our special guest for this broadcast, Nina May, who, together with uh, her husband, Colby, is part of a dynamic duo, which I would set against Hillary and Bill any day of the week. Uh, Colby is a distinguished attorney, works with the Center, American Center for Law and Justice, and uh, is active in a number of uh, First Amendment cases. And Nina is probably best known for her having founded and for her leading an organization called Renaissance Women. Before we get into other things, Nina, tell us about Renaissance Women. Well, I founded it back in 1983 when the um, feminist movement was trying to speak for all women. And <clears throat> basically we said that a Renaissance Woman can speak for herself. She can set her own agenda for personal achievement. And we say that uh, Renaissance Women are winners, not whiners, and victors, not victims, and leaders, not followers. And, uh, and it's really interesting how it seems that right after... We started our group, Phyllis started hers, and Beverly LaHaye started Concerned Women for America, that the whole feminist movement just sort of, you know, died out because women were realizing that, you know, why would I go from them saying that, okay, you can't listen to a man and have a man tell you what to do, but listen to us and we'll tell you what to do, you know, trading basically one oppressor for another in their opinion. And so he said, I don't think so. We're not that dumb. <laughs> So we and how does one that. become a member of Renaissance Women they, other than being a woman? Well, we, we say it's a mindset. It's not a club, you know, because you can't make someone a Renaissance Woman, but you can't tell a woman who is a Renaissance Woman that she's not. I mean, either you are or aren't a Renaissance Woman is kind of our motto. But if they go to um, rwnetwork.net, you can see a list of the Renaissance Women on there, and they post their own... Um, articles and blogs and pictures and movies, whatever they want to do. No one tells them they can or can't. They just do. Now, my recollection is that uh, over the years, or during a period of years, you have sponsored some phenomenal food fests. Yeah. Was that, <laughs> is that a way of raising money for Renaissance Well, Women? that was really kind of how the whole uh, group accidentally started. It was a 50 states party because at that time I ran a publishing company and most of my clients were congressmen. I had about 150 congressmen that um, that I was doing work for. And so I wanted to open up this townhouse that I bought on Capitol Hill, and I wanted to have a big party, and I wanted to invite all the, the staff members. And I thought, well, gee, they're from all over the country. What kind of theme? Can we southern, northern? I said, oh, I know. We'll just have food from every state in the nation. So what I did is I invited about 18 of my friends, my women friends, to come and uh, help me you know, divide up who's going to cook what and all. And I needed to call them something, and I didn't know who was going to come, and it was going to be in two weeks. And so I just came up with the term Renaissance Women. And so I had to sell them on the idea of being a Renaissance Woman. So I said, well, to me, you're all Renaissance Women because of this and this. And I know you're not feminist, although you're very accomplished and you're doing what you're doing. And for the next three hours, and we didn't talk food, we talked about how they were all feeling exactly the same way, that they were very frustrated with the whole feminist movement, that the ERA was an absolute scam, but we never really talked about it. Everyone was just doing their own you know, thing, fulfilling their own agendas. And at the end of it, two weeks later when everyone came to the party, they said, wow, this is great. Who are the Renaissance women? And we started telling them what we had <laughs> talked about two weeks ago. And before you know it, we had about 400 women that were joined in this group that didn't really even exist. And Phyllis Schlafly was one of our, not Phyllis Schlafly, um, um, Whittlesley, Faith Whittlesley was yes. one of our first members. And she had us through the White House, and it just was amazing. Did you wind up debating growing. any of the feminists? Yeah, the very first one I debated was um, Betty Friedan, and then Phil Donahue saw me debate that. Well, and if then... it was a beauty contest, I'm sure you won. <laughs> well, it was so funny because she was so aggressive and so, you know, I, I don't know, sort of outrageous that I thought, well, that can't possibly be appealing. So I was just sort of myself, and... Bones were ringing off the hook, and Phil Donahue saw that. So he called, it was Charlie Rose show, he called Charlie and said, can you get me this person, Nina May? I want her to debate Gloria Steinem. Well, I just about had, I mean, I almost died. I was, you know, young and naive, and this was, would be my second TV show, you know, debating Gloria Steinem on uh, Phil Donahue. And I tell you, I prayed about it and said, okay, two things can happen. 
I cannot do it and always regret that I didn't do it, as scared as I am to do this. Or I can do it and die of a heart attack. Huh. No one's going to even know who Nina May is. It'll make a you know blip in the headlines. Woman dies of a heart attack debating Gloria Steinem. Wow, you know who, who's that? You know. So I thought I got nothing to lose really. So I had a great time. And the, the thing that I learned about was that it a was, triumph. Oh. Absolutely. In fact, it was such a triumph. Let me just tell you, I got to brag a little. Go ahead. When he did his final wrap up show, you know, after all the years that he was, you know, had been Phil Donahue, they did clips of different shows. They used that clip from that show because it was the first time that, that basically he pretty much stayed out of it and he let the guests go at it. But the guests were, we weren't really arguing with each other. The audience was basically beaten up on her and I was just sitting there watching. <laughs> I mean, it was the most amazing thing. It was almost as though it was therapeutic for them to be able to share their frustrations with the, with the feminist movement. And I learned during that show that you'll never, ever convince the person you're arguing with. You, I mean, they've already got their, that's their livelihood. That's their position. They're a lobbyist. They're a, a PR candidate for whatever the, <laughs> sorry, whatever the, the cause is. And you're the same way. So you're trying to convince your audience. Don't try and, and sway that person. And so the people that would get on these shows and argue and argue and argue always lost. So you have to appeal to the audience. So that was a, a great lesson without anyone teaching you how to do that. So even Phil Donahue liked you? Yeah, he did. He did. I was, um, I was very touched by that. I guess he couldn't see that. I was just shaking like a leaf. Well, he can be fair. <laughs> He can be fair. Yeah, he was. He as was liberal as he is, day. I've been on his program a few times when he yeah, had it. Yeah, yeah, he was very. And he fair. always uh, was very fair. And she was very upset that he didn't come in and sort of, you know, take her position. And the interesting thing is, D. Jepson, at that time, was in the White House, and uh, she and I were friends, and we were sharing. D. was uh, the wife of Senator Roger. S Jepson. Roger Jepson, exactly. She was in the Office of Public Liaison, and about six months later, we ran into each other. You know, what have you been doing? Where have you been going? Oh, da, 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 da. She goes, oh, and, you know, six months ago I debated Gloria Steinem. I said, I did too. Where? In Chicago. And we, we pinpointed the date. And she goes, oh, my gosh. That explains it. I said, what? She says, well, when I went in to debate her, it was on a radio show, she was very depressed and very upset. And her, her, her handlers were, you know, sort of trying to calm her down. And she, she Dee, being a fabulously wonderful human being, compassionate, was concerned about her and said, Gloria, is everything okay? And she don't talk to her. She, she was just on the Phil Donahue show, and she just <laughs> was taken down, and <laughs> Phil didn't stand up for her, and it was a horrible experience for her. And so it was really funny. I said, well, they're oh all my human. gosh. They're and all human. Exactly, exactly. And that's what Dee was saying. And Dee was actually having a chance to, you mm -hmm. know, to share with her. It was, very, it was very touching. Well, that's great. And um, have you pursued additional opportunities for television and radio commentary it, yeah I mean in fact I had my own TV show for a while and my really? own, yeah my own radio uh, show where were they commentary. broadcast all over the country it was um, basically a lot of Christian stations basically Christian networks and you it was and your husband are very strong Christians I know yes oh absolutely absolutely I mean that's that what's that's what gets us gets us all through I mean how can you not be why did you give up the programs it was a lot of work. I was doing the radio show, I was doing the TV show, and uh, we had our son, and we were kind of between schools. We didn't really know where to go, and basically we had no choice but to homeschool. So I made the decision that I wanted to homeschool him. So I put a lot of stuff on hold to do that. So we homeschooled for a couple of years. Did you enjoy that? I loved it. I would encourage any woman that has a young child, I'd say what, earlier than 10, if you don't know if you want to homeschool, earlier than 10 you know, might be a little bit, touchy but I tell you if you can get them in that 10 11 12 13 year old stage it's an amazing well, experience. I, I'm a great believer in homeschooling mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I have six children and our youngest son Sam was homeschooled literally from the time he was in his mother's womb oh wow that's we great. played music for him we read to him yeah. we talked to him while he was in the womb and he was delivered by cesarean section and when he came out of his mother, he was screaming, and I said, Sam, be quiet. He recognized my voice. He oh, wow. That's... Instantly <laughs> obeyed. I thought he... you say he came out reciting yeah. Shakespeare yeah. or something. <laughs> <laughs> he could have. Uh, and we homeschooled him all the way oh, that's great. into college, and uh, we love it. My eldest son, Doug, runs something called Vision Forum okay. Ministries, which caters to homeschool families all over America. He just had a tremendous 
Jamestown celebration of the uh -huh. 400th anniversary, and there were 4,000 people there, uh, most of them homeschoolers, if not all of them. Oh, that's great. And the typical family had, uh, uh, oh, anywhere from six or seven to 15 children. Wow. And uh, it, it was, uh, and some of them just had one or two children, whatever. But uh, they were all uh, homeschool families, and they will all attest to it. My wife attended the uh, uh, Heave Conference, Home Educators Alliance of Virginia. Right. Yeah, we used to go. Uh, and when she first went, there were a couple of thousand people there. This year, there were 12,000 wow. people. Wow. Wow. And uh, my eldest daughter, Amanda, has four boys who are being homeschooled, and uh, she went to the Heave Conference for the first time. Well, Nina, this has been delightful, but we need to talk about your award-winning oh. <laughs> movie, which is called Emancipation, Revelation, uh, Resolution, Revolution. Uh -huh. uh, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk about this. Okay. Stay with us. I'm Howard Phillips. Our guest for this broadcast is Mrs. Nina May. We'll be right back. The Bible tells us that parents are responsible for the nurture and admonition of their children. That means that the children are not the responsibility of civil government. They're not the responsibility of politicians, bureaucrats, and judges. They're res the responsibility of parents. The federal government is limited in its authorized scope to its delegated enumerated functions. Education is not one of them. Yet the role of the federal government in education has unfortunately been increased year after year after year. The conservative caucus promoting constitutional fidelity is working to completely remove the federal government from subsidy and regulation of education, which should be subject to parental and local determination and control. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors uh, this and other editions of Conservative Roundtable. We're pleased to have as our guest, yes, this is Nina May, the founder and leader of Renaissance Women. And Nina has produced an award-winning film called Emancipation, Revelation, Revolution. What is this film, Nina? It's the history of the Civil Rights Movement in America and the role that both political parties have played in it. And it shows what happens to conservative blacks who leave what we call the liberal plantation. And we have uh, the whole plantation theme going throughout it. And the liberal plantation is basically what the Democratic Party has created since the emancipation of the slaves. And uh, we follow all the way through from the founding of, for example, the Republican Party, which was founded by abolitionist Democrats who left the Democratic Party in 1854, founded the Republican Party, and then, you know, subsequently moved forward. You had Lincoln as the, the president who um, was the first Republican president. Then, of course, you had the war. And then uh, after the war, the Republicans were basically in charge. They sponsored the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment unanimously. That was uh, uh, emancipation, uh, equal rights, and then the voting rights. And it was 100 percent opposed by the Democrats. You move forward to the end of that century, and they, the two dozen civil rights bills that the Republicans had passed are now overturned because the Democrats are in control of the House, the Senate, and the White House. And not only did they overturn all these civil rights bills, oh, I forgot to mention that they founded the KKK, and it's in the congressional record, 13 volumes in the congressional record, that the Democratic Party founded the KKK. And it was specifically, and they say, it was not so much to kill blacks, but it was to take back control of the Congress from the Republicans to have Democratic control. And boy, it just sounds exactly the same way they are today. So anyway, so even though they 
they were ignoring all of these laws. They overturned the civil rights laws. You had Plessy v. Ferguson basically thumbed its nose at the 14th Amendment. They instituted what were called Jim Crow laws that made sure that blacks could not exercise the 15th Amendment to their right to vote. You had the poll taxes and the and literacy tests and on and on and on. They said, we will put them back on a plantation come hell or high water, no matter how we have to do it. Of course, you had a segregated society. And, you know, the rest is history. That's why we have institutionalized racism in this country. So we try and unravel that and say, if the Democrats had not fought so hard to keep this country segregated, to discriminate against blacks, to overturn and ignore 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, couldn't overturn the 13th, but they could overturn or ignore the 14th, 15th Amendment, mm -hmm that we would not have institutionalized uh, racism as we do in this country. Let me argue that uh, the 14th Amendment for sure was improperly added to the Constitution. And there are still many constitutional scholars who argue that uh, the manner in which it was uh, added to the Constitution uh, made it uh, of questionable validity. In other words, uh, states which were not considered part of the Union were obliged to ratify it as a precondition uh, to re-entry to the mm -hmm. Union. Mm -hmm. And of course the 14th Amendment has uh, many things in it which I personally oppose. Uh, for example, until the 14th Amendment, uh, one was a citizen of a state and therefore a citizen of the United States, but that was flipped by the 14th Amendment so that uh, you were a citizen of the United States and only secondarily a citizen of your state. I would, and I believe me, I have no uh, love for any kind of uh, racism. It's uh, totally unchristian. But historically, uh, the, the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, which deteriorated into a very nefarious entity, uh, involved uh, many people who, in the beginning, were challenging the abuses of uh, Reconstruction in which uh, uh, the, in many ways, represented the victory of Northern Unitarianism over Southern Presbyterianism. Oh, yeah. But having right, placed all right. of this on the record, back yeah. to you. Yeah, no, and, and, and you're right. I mean, it was still a divided nation, and Johnson, of course, was a Democrat and basically turned his, his eye uh, away from all of the problems that were going on during Reconstruction and everything. The interesting thing that, about the 14th Amendment is that the immigration, pro-immigration amnesty people are using the 14th Amendment to justify allowing the children that are born here in America to illegals to say that, well, they are citizens if they're yeah, born they're here. Babies. And it is, it is very upsetting to the black community because they're saying, wait a second, that was our amendment. That amendment was to make sure that we were given citizenship because even though we were, were born there and we were you know, brought here against our will 250 years you know, without even citizenship, without the right to vote, they had to make sure that even though they were free, they were still in, and, and decidedly uh, uh, given citizenship and, and rights. And reputable legal scholars make clear that uh, that amendment does not cover uh, people who are lawbreakers. Mm -hmm. That uh, if you're not under the proper lawful jurisdiction right. of the United States, mm -hmm. having a child born in the United States does not automatically right. qualify that child or all of its relatives for citizenship. Exactly, exactly. So anyway, so going into the movie, we, we move forward all the way through to the uh, civil rights movement, and uh, we interview about 20, but 20, 23 conservative black leaders, and it starts with them telling how they are treated when they leave this liberal plantation. For example, we've heard about how Connie Rice and Clarence Thomas and Colin Powell are treated. The names are called. They're called Aunt Jemima, Uncle Tom's. Um, kitchen slaves or, you know, A even lot of worse. this is the direct result of the Great Society. In 1963, when uh, Lyndon Johnson was imposing the Great Society, uh, I was a candidate for chairman of the Republican Party of Boston, a mm. position to which I was elected in 1964. And I worked closely with leaders in the black community. And I saw how conservative black leaders were undermined by the Great Society. Mm -hmm. Homosexuals were put in charge of key positions, radical pro-abortion people. Uh, the uh, conservative black Christian clergy 
was undercut by the uh, uh, Great Society programs, and uh, they put the most radical people in charge. For and that, quick and quick that anecdote on that. Robert Cord, C-O-A-R-D, was the head of Action for Boston Community Development, which was a radical community action program. He was getting $25 million a year from Uncle Sam mm. at the very time that Ronald Reagan was arresting his brother, Bernard Cord, in Grenada uh, as oh. being the number one communist there. So in any event, yeah. the Great Society radicalized the black community. Yeah. It made pariahs, as you say, mm -hmm. of the real heroes in right. the black community. Yeah. who were patriotic, pro-life, pro-family, mm -hmm. and it did much to undercut through the welfare programs the exactly. stability of the black it, family. It, it basically, it established a new plantation, this plantation of, of victimization, of government handouts. And it, before that happened, the black community, 82% of the families in the, black, in the black community were intact, mothers, fathers, children born in wedlock, not out of wedlock. But then, of course, when you usher in the type of programs you're talking about, First, they said, okay, we'll give this to you, but you've got to get the man out of the house. Very much like slavery did. It divided the families. It, was, it said it no man tragedy. can be in the home. It, the it, black community it, was uh, Christian-oriented. Exactly. It was conservative. They became the chattel for the Democratic Party is what happened. Now, we're going to take a break. When we come back, mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm going to uh, give it all to you and tell us everything we need to know about your movie okay. and how people can be supportive of it. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Night of Night. There are many conservative organizations, but the Conservative Caucus is unique in that our standard for evaluating public policy is the Constitution of the United States. Our goal is to advocate policies which conform to what the Constitution stipulates and to oppose those which undermine the Constitution. It's clear that the federal government has only those powers which are provided in the Constitution which were initially delegated by the states to the federal government or which were subsequently added by amendment. If we adhered to that principle, your taxes would be lower and your liberties would be more secure. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626. Find curious facts from America's past at LOC.gov, the Library of Congress website. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Thanks for watching Conservative Roundtable, sponsored by the Conservative Caucus. I'm going to turn the rest of the program over to our guest, Nina May, to tell us about her movie, Emancipation, Revelation, Revolution. Nina, it's all yours. Well, as I was saying before, we've got about 23 conservative black leaders that we interviewed in that, and all of them tell what happens, or what has happened to them as they've left the liberal plantation and embraced conservative values. The names they're called, they get death threats, they... Um, uh, they're vilified, they're rejected in their community, and all because they basically are embracing values that even Martin Luther King uh, embraced. In fact, his niece is in it, Alveda King, and uh, she talks about being a Republican, and, the, and again, the names she's called, and the names that her uh, cousin, Bernice King, who's the daughter of, are called, and, and how they have to constantly battle that new form of discrimination, which is philosophical discrimination. So the point we make in there, too, is that Martin Luther King's dream has been realized, but not the way he intended it to be, that blacks are no longer being judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character, and the judgment is very harsh if, it, if they embrace conservative values. And then going along, again, the same concept of the, of the plantation uh, symbolism, they have overseers in a plantation, and they, these are the leaders. I'm I'm just the fly on the wall interviewing them. You never see me or hear me. We have 15 but, seconds. How can people learn oh, more about oh, this? Oh, e, it's errvideo.com, and you can order a copy there. You can see all about it. You can read about the different people on there. So um, maybe you'll do a little thingy. It says e, errvideo.com, and everyone needs to see this. And uh, right now, 
uh, we're showing a portion of a trailer from this movie. So stay tuned and watch this trailer. Let my people go. The nation has always been divided on moral issues. During the Revolutionary War, the nation was divided between those who wanted their independence from England and those who remained loyal to the oppressive crown. Less than 100 years later, the nation would divide on the issue of slavery. That too was an issue of freedom versus oppression. And now, almost 150 years since the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, the country is still divided, not along racial lines, but philosophical lines. This division is not necessarily along party lines, and there has been a subtle shift in the political landscape because of the issue of moral values. The black community in America historically has had at its core faith in God and strong moral values. So the political discussion on these issues is causing a schism in the black community and shaking the foundations of political establishment. Blacks today are beginning to discover the historical differences in the political parties and are choosing to leave the liberal plantation and experience individuality without the establishment telling them how to think and who to vote for. What happens though when blacks who have been captive to one political party choose to not only leave the plantation but bring others with them? <laughs> 